to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free john chapter 8 verse number 32 welcome to our study of the truth in this series of lessons we're going to be looking at several various topics of which we turn to the scriptures to determine what god's truth on these subjects are. And as we think about these subjects in God's truth, Jesus so aptly said, it's truth, not popular opinion, not what a court may decide, not what men want to hear, it's truth that actually sets us free to serve God and do what God wants us to in this life. As always, our lessons are brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ Worldwide. The Church of Christ in your area. We'd love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you don't know much about the church, or maybe you've never visited the Church of Christ, they're a friendly group of people who want to just simply follow the Bible and be the New Testament church that you read about in God's Holy Word. At thegospelofchrist.com, we also, through our website, make available all our lessons free of charge. You can download them from our website or you can request a free DVD or CD. And as always, if you've got a Bible question or you'd like to study God's Word further, please email us or call us or write to us at the information given at the end of this lesson and we'd be more than happy to help you in your endeavor to learn more about God's truth. As we think about truth, there are several things that are very, very important for us to notice. First, let's realize that truth is the most important commodity, is the most important possession any civilization can have. The proverb writer said this in Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Whatever truth costs me, whether it be friends, whether it be family, whether it be a job, whether it be old ways or habits, whatever I have to give up or sacrifice to gain truth. The proverb writer said that we need to buy it and never, ever sell the truth. Now, stop and think about the value of truth for just a moment. How would you know what 2 plus 2 is if there wasn't some standard of truth? If there wasn't a standard for mathematics that everybody knows 2 plus 2 is 4, and that's a, a truth that can never be debated or denied. If there were no truth, what would the world be like? How would we know what's right and what's wrong? How would you know what side of the road to drive on if there wasn't a certain truth or standard, even in things like that? How would you know anything without truth? How would you even know you're here? How would you know you exist? How would you know that this is not just some idea that happened or some existential reality? How would we know anything? without truth. Friend, truth is indeed one of the most valuable possessions any people can have. As we think about truth, we want to begin by asking this very simple question that Pilate asked. In John 18 verses 36 through 38, Pilate, when he was confronted by Jesus, and Jesus responded by saying, I'm of the truth, I speak the truth, Pilate said, what is truth? Well, let's ask that same question. What is truth? I want to give a fourfold answer to this question that helps us to understand the ideas that we're talking about. First, God is truth. 2 Chronicles 15 verse 3, the scripture says that we serve a God of truth. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, Paul said of Thessalonians that they turn from sin, from idols, to God to serve, notice now, the true and living God. What's truth? 
Friend, the very idea of God Himself, His nature, His character, and His qualities. He's the representation of truth. It's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6 verse 18. God does not change. Malachi chapter 3 verse number 6. But as we think about truth and what it really is, not only is God truth, Jesus Christ, His Son, is also truth. Ephesians 4 verse 21, the Scripture records that the truth is in Jesus. Do you remember John 14, 6? Jesus had just told His disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. Yes, I'm going away, but don't get discouraged. Here's why. I'm going to prepare you a better place. And when I come again... I receive it to myself that you can come there with me in essence. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so as we think about truth, God himself is truth. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is truth. And friend, the Holy Spirit is truth. John chapter 16 verse 13 says, When he... The Spirit of truth has come. He'll guide you into all truth. 1 John 5 verse 6, again, referencing the Holy Spirit as Spirit of truth. And so, what is God's Holy Spirit? It speaks truth. And naturally so, because it reveals unto us God and Jesus and God's ultimate plan of salvation. Now, along with the Godhead, Naturally, we mention today when we talk about what is truth, God's Word is absolute truth. I want you to notice John chapter 17, verse number 17. Jesus, in praying to the Father, said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. What's truth? God's Word. Every one of God's righteous judgments endures forever, the psalmist would say. Psalm 119, 160 so beautifully illustrates God's truth. Listen to this. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. How much of this book is truth? Is part of it fables? Part of it men's ideas? Part of it written by somebody later? The Scripture says the entirety. From Genesis 1-1, to Revelation 22, 21, every bit of this book is from God and is absolute truth. And so those four things help us to understand what truth is. But you know, as we think about truth, that may give us some ideas, but how do you really define truth? Well, I said to you, define truth for me. How would you do that? Well, here are some words we might use in defining truth. First, we would say that truth is something that is right or upright. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 8, God's commandments are right and just. Psalm 119, verse 128, the scripture says God commandments are, God's commandments are upright or right and true. And so as we think about truth, we're talking about that which is right, opposed to wrong, opposed to error, God and God's Word are right or upright. We might use the word just in talking about truth. Revelation 15 verse 3 refers to God as a just God. Will not the judge of all the earth do justly? The question was asked in the book of Genesis, and the answer is a resounding yes. God's just, fair, noble, upright, honorable. Those are all words that would go along with truth. Thirdly, we would say that truth is trustworthy. If it's true, I can trust it. I can take it to the bank. I can base my faith on that. Now that's what the Bible also says about God and His Word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your paths and all your ways and He'll direct your paths. God is trustworthy. Job said in Job 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so when we talk about truth, we're talking about something that can be trusted, something we can put our faith in. But another way or another word we might use to describe truth is that which is perfect or complete. 
James says in James 1 verse 25 that we're to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls and it is called the perfect law of freedom or liberty. Perfect, the Greek word there means complete, not lacking, total everything we need to be right with God. And so it's right, it's just, it's something I can trust, and it is complete and perfect in every way. Now, let's take just a few moments and let's think about just how important truth is to our spiritual lives. How important is truth? How important is it that a person know God's truth and understand that? Friend, truth is very important because of modern relativism today. By relativism, we mean that one person thinks one thing's right, another person thinks another thing's right, and whatever may be right to you may not be right to somebody else, but it's just kind of relative and it changes all the time. Friend, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches that truth, especially the truth of God, does not change and is not relative. It is not something that man constantly needs to be shifting to and from and finding one truth or finding another. No, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, I want you to notice Jeremiah chapter 7. Look in verse number 28 with me. Jeremiah said, So you shall say to them, This is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Watch this. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. They were doing what everybody else was doing. They were going along with the winds of change and whatever the other nations did. That's what they wanted to do. And God said, because of your view of truth, it's perished from this nation. Relativism says everything is subjective. And yet we can know this is not true for several reasons. Is it the case that everything is subject to change and might be one thing one day and another thing another? Friend, in every other area of life, we don't think like that. For example, there are universal standards of truth in, say, for example, science. For example, the law of gravity. How subjective is that? How relative is it? If you drop a bowling ball today it's going to land on your toe. And if you drop a bowling ball tomorrow, tomorrow it'll land on your toe. And the next day, and the next, you see the laws of gravity, they don't change. Laws of math, they don't change. Uh, there are certain things that are just the same. Our law, it's going to stay the same. But somehow when we come to religion, we just kind of want to say, well, that's all relative. Friend, God's not relative. We've already seen that. His truth is not relative. It's not going to change. And therefore, we need to do away with this idea that everything in the religious world is relative. See, God Himself clearly says He's not a relative or subjective God. The Bible says in Malachi 3 verse 6, God speaking says, I am God. I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, the Hebrew writer said, Jesus is the same yesterday, past, today, present, and tomorrow, future. Same past, present, and future. Today, tomorrow, and in the future, God, His Son, Jesus Christ, will be the same. And friend, here's what we really want to emphasize. As we think about this idea of relativism as it relates to religion, please understand, the Word of God is meant to be the one final standard that is not going to change. It's going to stay the same, and it's going to be that which judges us in the last day. How do we know that? Notice these words of Jesus in John chapter 12, verse number 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. Now listen. The word that I have spoken, Jesus said, will judge him in the last day. When Jesus was here on earth 2,000 years ago, when he was preaching and teaching and doing great miracles, that same word he proclaimed then is going to, was the standard then and will be the standard for all men on the judgment day. Friend, clearly then, that's not going to change. That standard is going to stay the same. And so... Truth doesn't change because of people. People change because of truth. Truth doesn't change because a society may do things immoral. 
A society ought to change to accept truth. Truth doesn't change because of us. We change to get our lives in line with the truth of God's Word. But why else then is truth such an important possession? Friend, truth is important because of man's ability. My ability or my inability and your inability. Man's inability to direct himself spiritually. I want you to notice the words of Jeremiah 10, verse number 23. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. What are we talking about there? Jeremiah is talking about how to get right with God and how to live right and how to help Israel be what they want to be. And he's telling Israel, you've got to stop leaning upon your own thinking. You've got to look to God. Only he can direct your steps. Only God's truth can help us get to heaven. Remember Proverbs 16, verse 25? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. We need to stand in the old paths and ask for the good way, where the way that will lead to heaven is, that will direct our soul. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 16. Now, as you think about God's Word and its ability to direct us, I want you to think about how God can do that and how far off base we are. For example, God's Word is able to direct us in that it tells us how we got here. Genesis 1.1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created man in His own image. Genesis 1.27 The Lord God created man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into His nostril the breath of life. Man became a living being. Genesis 2 verse 7 Now, you take that and you think about the theories of men. Theories of evolution. Big bang theories where somehow men evolved from monkeys. Somehow... Over millions of years ago, there was some cosmic explosion and out of nothing we came to exist. And then God tells us, I created you. I created you in my image. You were given a soul and that soul is here to glorify me. And one day you'll have to give an account of how you've dealt with that. It answers questions like, why am I here? You know, so many people are here for a multitude of reasons are, are living for a multitude of reasons that are just not right. Some are out for lust or pleasure, popularity, pride. And then there are some who simply don't know why they're here, just kind of floating through life without real meaning and purpose. God's Word and its truth is able to direct our steps when it comes to our purpose. What's our purpose? Isaiah said in Isaiah 43 verse 7, Everyone who's called by my name, God says, whom I created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I've made him. Did you get that? God said, I created you for my glory. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. Do you remember Solomon's search for meaning in life? Solomon tried it all, good and bad alike. He went through the whole list of things to find purpose, and he said, all is vanity and like trying to catch the wind, until he came to the right conclusion. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. God will bring every work into judgment, including good or bad, whether secret or open. And God will judge us because of that. And so I'm here to fear God and keep His commandments. And only the Word of God gives me that, that grand and noble purpose that is so much more than about me. It's about serving God. Thirdly, God's truth is so important because it directs my steps to where I need to go after this life. Only the Bible and only God's truth can send us in the right direction when I leave this life. Oh, it's true. All who are in the grave will one day come forth. I'm not going to stay here forever. This earth isn't designed to last forever. One day I'm going to come up out of the grave and Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, the righteous will go into eternal life and the unrighteous into eternal 
condemnation. What book, what truth can help me prepare for the other side? Friend, only the Word of God, God's truth, can do that. Thirdly, we mention that truth is so vital and so important because it is the only thing that can set us free from sin. John chapter 8, I want you to notice what Jesus again said. In this context, Jesus has been discussing with the Jews about their need for Him and their need for salvation through Him. And of course, they've got questions about Abraham and they thought because they were Abraham's children, they were going to be right anyway. And Jesus corrects that. But I want you to notice what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse number 32. The Lord said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now watch verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Not Abraham, not Moses, not the patriarchs. Jesus said, you've got to know the truth to be free. What truth? That I am the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You see, truth has the marvelous power to free men from the bondage of sin. Paul said in Romans 6, 17, God be thanked. Though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from a heart, the heart that form of doctrine to what you were delivered. And having become set free from sin, we became heirs of righteousness, slaves of righteousness. Obedience to the truth sets us free from sin. You see, my friend, all of us have to deal with the consequences of sin. Psalm 38, verse 4, the psalmist said, My sins have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. All of us have felt that. All of us know the sting of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, and yet the gospel has the ability to free us from that. I'm now free to obey Christ and follow His teaching and His doctrine. Now, we want to mention this also. Truth is so vitally important because of the abundance of error that's being taught today. John chapter 8, verse 44, the Bible says that the devil is a liar, he's a murderer, he's the father of lies, and there's no truth in him. And friend, I assure you, he has talked people into calling good evil and evil good. Isaiah 30, verse 10, and Isaiah 5, verse 13. And people are now so confused because of the mass amount of error that sometimes it's hard to wade through that until we turn to God's truth. Now, let's illustrate that. The truth of God is so important because of the mass amount of error today that's being taught on salvation. You take 10 different people and ask them, what must I do to be saved? You'll likely get 10 different answers. You come to this book, you'll get one answer. Here's what you don't find. Billy Graham and Franklin Graham have gone around the country preaching and teaching that all you've got to do to be saved is call on the name of Jesus and say the sinner's prayer. Dear Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and save me now. And I hear that and I've read it from their pamphlets, but the one thing I can't find is where's that at in the Bible? Friend, you can search from Genesis 1-1 to the very end of Revelation, and you will not find the sinner's prayer. What? It's not in there? Not even one time. What do you find? You find men and women being told to hear the Word. Romans 10 verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You find Jesus saying, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. You find people being commanded to repent or perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. You find people being told that they must confess Jesus to be confessed by Jesus. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And yes, you find Jesus Christ saying, Baptism is essential to salvation. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. You find the apostle Peter saying, baptism is for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. You find Jesus saying, one must be baptized to get into God's kingdom, which is going to heaven. 
Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 5. And friend, you find so clearly in Scripture that baptism is for salvation. Meaning, you must be baptized to be saved. Where is that at in the Bible? 1 Peter 3 verse 21. The Bible says there is a like figure unto which now does now save us baptism. Not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Friend, did the Bible just say right there, baptism saves us? Clearly and explicitly, it absolutely did. The Scripture doesn't teach you've got to say a sinner's prayer, but it does teach. You've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized to be saved. And so all the religious error that we're facing today, all the problems that are occurring, whether it be problems related to immorality, whether it be problems as it relates to salvation or problems our country is dealing with, how do we deal with those problems? Here's how. We've got to buy the truth and sell it not. But before you can buy it, you've got to know what it is. And to know what the truth is, you've got to go to the right source. God, His Son, His Holy Spirit, and God's Word are absolute truth. That means I've got to do my part to find truth. I've got to study to show myself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. I need to be like those in, in noble Bereans in Acts 17, 11, who search the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I want to know what truth is. I want, to, I want to buy that truth because of its value, not because of what may or may not be popular, but because that's what God wants me to do. Regardless of who says or does what, all that matters is, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, verse 17. What do the Scriptures say? Romans 4, verse 3. Friend, we hope that in thinking about the truth today, each of us have been encouraged to look into God's truth and whatever it teaches to buy into that knowing, knowing that heaven will be our reward. And so we encourage you today, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you've never accepted truth, obey God's plan of salvation and let truth have its full reign in your life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. And to God be we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.